Uh, here I have a Moran's amplifier. This is a, what is it, PM420. Sounds like a time in the afternoon, but interesting look at what I think. They're LEDs or something there. Looks like it's got push buttons to adjust things. And, you know, that's definitely LEDs for the volume. And supposedly the volume doesn't work on this, but where is, oh, there's the touch volume. Oh, it's got a fast and normal. Rather weird. Audio muting, oh, they're just normal switches. One of these champagne gold sort of colored Marantzes. Gone a bit yellow in the thing here. I assume it's the Perspex itself, so I don't know whether that can be polished off or that needs to be replaced. And it does have this remote volume thing I noticed on here, but it doesn't seem to have an actual proper, like any sign of an infrared remote control. Made in Japan. Repaired by Echo Electronics Proprietary Limited, Belgrave Street, Manly. So up in Sydney somewhere, 02 phone number. Not sure when these were made, I guess in the 80s sometime. Phono, tuner, video, CD, tape to auxiliary. That covers your bases. Tape one, monitor in out. Figure eight, plug for the power. I'd say not a particularly powerful system. System 1, 4 to 16. I mean, probably a 30 watt amp or something. Looks like it's got a STK chip in it. Well, at least if it's just a volume control issue, it's not a blown STK chip, hopefully. Unless they mean there is no sound at all, which is some people's idea of no volume. So, oh yeah, look, we've got some. Oh, you like press it and it goes up and down. <laughs> what a weird design. Kind of a snazzy looking front on it. Oh yes, system one and two. Obviously they thought LEDs were the thing that people would be into. Subsonic filter. And I assume... That's an interesting one, if the volume doesn't do anything, or at least the indication is that it's not doing anything. That flicked a bit weirdly. Yeah, that switch is rather dicky, I think. CD slash tape copy. Pono tuner. Yeah, the tape mon one's a bit. This thing's probably been set in the sun a fair bit, but that shouldn't affect the volume, I wouldn't think. Oh, well, let's hook some audio up to it. Oh, first thing, I better check the DC on the output. Are both our outputs on? Yes. Oh, well, there's a, I think it sounded like a speaker protection relay kicking in, so uh, did I just get that into memory mode or something? Still, best to check them. Nothing worse than blowing your test speakers up. Just check everything. All seems to be fine. Let's turn it off in case it's coming out at high volume or something. I think I'd be organised with this, but anyway. Now, is that speaker A system one on top? Some amps do them one on top, one on the bottom for each speaker on one particular output. Most do it across, but someone had to decide to do it the other way. So now, no technician can ever trust them. Let's get some CD audio happening. And try and find it. CD out. Let's go to the video CD tape auxiliary. It's got to work on that one, surely. Get ready to be deafened. Correct, the volume doesn't seem to do anything. But at least the amp's running. Turn the power off. So I assume we've got an issue with the switches on this one. But, how does it actually, it's got a remote volume thing, it's a bit odd. How does the volume actually go up and down?
Oh my god. <laughs> what on earth? Looks like a motorised volume control there, but with no knob on it, of course. So we should be able to manually in here. We've got a speaker protection relay there, which is good to see. And man, is that all blackened inside or is that my imagination? Maybe it's just the smoky plastics. It's not above the contact parts. So I don't know, yeah, it just looks a bit darker than it should there, but I think it's just thicker bits of plastic. Oh, this is, God, I haven't seen one of these in a long time. It's got a little um, secondary SDK chip, voltage amplifier SDK3042, which I think is just like a pre-driver chip. But you used to see them a bit in 80s amps. And yeah, but not many of them used them, I don't think. And it's been, it would have to be bloody 30 years, I reckon, since I saw one of those. God, I remember I think I had to replace the amp chip and one of those in something that I think someone else had diagnosed it. But I do remember replacing, I think, the pair in some amp. But yeah, that's possibly the only one I ever did because you didn't see them very often. So... It's got a different input. But I should be able to... I'm just being careful there's no dangerous voltages here. Oh, can I turn that? Or is it just seized up, maybe? I wonder if it's been sitting around so long it's... the pot's seized up or something. Because it doesn't seem to want to turn by hand. I reckon it's... yeah, oh god. What on... it's clicking. <laughs> the grease looks dried up on it. Oh man, I managed to turn it one way. Ooh, listen to it. <laughs> That is one seized up old pot, I think. Well, if that's the case, I wonder if a bit of switch cleaner lubricant would be enough. Probably not, but unless it's the actual motor that's seized and causing it to... Maybe I'm grating the gears on that or something. God, I think I'm going to have to get more contact cleaner. This stuff's just about at it. There's plenty in there, though. Need a bit more than a bit of that, I think. Oh, where's the... No, that hasn't helped. Let's um, power it up. Yeah, well, it's definitely altered the volume, at least. I guess the next thing is, does the... How are we going to know if the motor is trying to turn or not? Ah, rolling meters in a mess. What have we got there? Just a capacitor. Oh, they actually... They're connected. Let's see if we get any voltage, I guess, on this pot when I press the buttons. Like, is something trying to tell the motor to run? Oh yeah, three volts. So it's definitely not a control issue. And yeah, lower voltage when we go to the normal. So they just put a lower two volts in when you go to normal speed. Three volts when you go to higher. Well, I don't think I've ever actually had to fix one of these motorised volume controls. Oh, the bottom does come off this thing by the look of it. I mean, other than maybe replace one because it's noisy, but... I don't think I've ever had to pull one apart and try and fix it, but this one we're going to have to. Because I don't think that's a standard unit at all. A lot of the later motorised volume controls other than maybe varying in how many K the resistance elements are. I think they're all pretty much mechanically the same, but they're nothing like that one. But of course this one's not designed to stick out the front. So they may have specifically made it. So they obviously wanted an easy remote control via some sort of, well, I guess just a voltage in one direction and you, or the other. So there's probably a voltage coming out the back of that and you just reverse it and send it back 
as a positive or negative voltage or something. So where on earth is it? This thing here, it must be. Oh my God, look how many connections it's got to it. <laughs> Only two, four, six, eight times two plus another, so it's 20, 24, and then those two, 20, that's the motor tabs, I think. So at least 26. And then you add in the motor actual wires, there's about 28 connections to it. That's pretty crazy. For volume control. So we've got, we've got two stereo pots, two stereo pots. Sure, what do we need two stereo pots there for as well? That doesn't make any sense at all. We've got two big banks, and then we've got another two banks of, well, are they switches or pots? Because they've got four on each. What the hell have they actually got going on here? So it's like two double, two ten, are they ten terminal? Two, four, six, eight terminal. So if even that was a dual pot with everything disconnected and separate, that's still only six terminals. And you could add loudness taps would give you eight. But then you've got a second one of them. I'm gonna have to look at the menu on this thing, see what on earth they're doing in there. And I've got a big chip there, which probably is what runs, that goes back to the front panel while we'll go at. What is it we've got a, a Sasenio chip of all things, LC7815 and an LC4066 is just a CMOS chip. Quad bilateral switch I think. That's probably your input switching I would guess, it probably all those buttons go in LEDs, so that Sasenio chip probably runs all these LEDs as well. And then it tells those quadrilateral switches based on your input selection what to switch there. And these must just, I can see why they wouldn't have made their own one because that's probably a chip that already existed from Senyo or something. And some designer probably saw it and thought, oh, that'd be a cool thing to put LEDs all over the front of this thing. Let's get one of those in. But yeah, if you're not going to have remote control, why have push buttons at all, really? I'd actually prefer rotary pots, because you can just set them instantly where you want them very quickly, whereas buttons, you usually got to wait around for it to go along, shift up, shift down, because they can't do them too quickly, whereas a pot, you just give it a tweak and it's where you want it. But I understand, yeah, if you've got remote control, you need push buttons usually because you want digital signals to do everything. But yeah, I actually see them as kind of a cheap feature in a way for cheap units that need to use remote control because that's what they were usually on. Whereas a nice potentiometer, like I say, you just grab it and turn it where you want it. Much nicer to use. No, admittedly, you're probably not going to be tweaking many of these pots very often besides your volume control, and so even that would have been a bit of a pain with this unit probably. But I like that they, they had the decency to add a fast mode as well. You can, usually the Japanese are good at thinking up things like that to make it more user friendly. Whereas a lot of people either didn't think of it or didn't care about it. You're definitely not going to get the Germans putting on something user friendly like that. They usually send out design it the opposite to user friendly. But no, that's a nice feature to have a higher speed because otherwise, like I say, you're sitting around waiting all day just to change your volume control. And you're not going to buy another Marantz after that, probably. Like, you kind of put up, up with it on a cheapo thing, but. Expect a bit better user experience on high quality sort of stuff. Ah, gotta get that one. Big over one. That's the most important one to get because that's the one that's going to fight the hardest. I get a feeling I'm going to have to pull this whole pot to bits. If 
and at least disconnect the motor off it and see if the motor runs on its own because I don't know what parts actually seized yet. I wouldn't mind betting this has probably sat around for so long without being used that the grease has dried up on the pot itself but that'd be what I'd put my money on but yeah got it straight away it came off nice and easy. Yeah, it's just an, it's an all open kind of weird design. Uh, so that's the gear that's probably grating when I'm turning things. I reckon I'm scraping that gear against the worm thing, which I probably shouldn't have done really, but a bit naughty. But that's me. I'm not that fussed now. Does this, this whole front, I just wonder if I can disconnect that worm wheel, but got two tabs there, two tabs there, that still doesn't fully free this thing or maybe it does then you have the gear probably come loose or can oh wait can we can we lift that oh we can i can just do it by hand it's just on a spring okay that's looks like i can lift the worm wheel and try and f see if the motor runs i'm hoping oh actually it solves the problem anyway because if i hold that up i can turn this bit quite freely so it's not the pot that's faulty it's actually the motor, I think. Which is annoying, because now I do have to pull the whole thing to bits. But that, that turns quite freely. Are you kidding me? The motor's shot. It may just be that the motor doesn't turn at all. Well, it's, I'm going to try it anyway. You can actually hear it now. That motor is not, so maybe the motor's just faulty. Could even be open circuit or something. Because it does seem to turn all right. Or did. Am I turning it? Yeah, there it goes. Yeah, it's a bit hard to turn. A bit hard to tell. It did seem when I first poked the screwdriver in there to turn all right. But that's a nice design that they've actually made it so you can, whether intentionally or not, I don't know, but made it so you can actually just press on the, the worm wheel to disengage it. Oh, those weird little flimsy pins on that. I thought they were going to be something solid. Oh, it's actually glued on, isn't it? Blue probably didn't do anything any good. Okay, let's let's get the main amp out of the way, I think. Yeah, shame you can't, un oops, can't unscrew it from the back. So the pot's on there, that's on this plate here. We're gonna have to bend all that up and then that just slots out, I think. Then I'm gonna have to be careful that the oh, that spring's still there. Now, I think they've actually designed this quite well, so you can remove this front bit. I've probably got to use some side cutters or something just to get under. I don't like using my circuit board ones, but usually they're the only ones that fit under there. So let's try the big ones. There, yeah, like that. Bend all these tabs up if I can. And they're not the easiest. There we go. The things you end up using side cutters for, but unfortunately, what other tool does it? can't really tend to get screwdrivers under these unless you really want to set them in a vice or something try and tap them under like get them to slide under there so I just tend to use side cutters most of my side cutters last pretty well even despite undoing the odd screws and bending the odd metal tabs like this oh come on Unfortunately, in the real world, you just got to use what does the job the best. Rather than being too fussed about it. Try and bend that a bit straighter. That one hasn't bent the best. Just, I've just got to be careful this other stuff doesn't all spring out everywhere. I don't think it will, but this is where a screwdriver might be useful now. Even then, 
it might be down to the side cutters to start separating this a bit it's coming or trying to if I can get that apart enough to get the screwdriver in there and keep it in there it really doesn't want to come apart I don't think that should just slot easily I would have thought screwdriver for this job I think again in the in the good old days you could have just ordered a new one and you would not mess around trying to fix a throwaway part basically a non-user serviceable part but there we go these days we don't have that luxury I'm afraid and yeah, this wouldn't have been a cheap part anyway. I wouldn't think. No what manufacturers like, they would have charged a few dollars for a motorized volume control and a multi gang pot. Uh, this is gonna make a bit of a mess of this, I think, but I don't have much choice here. Yeah, thankfully that bit stays in there, so that's the worm wheel. That's the end of the actual potentiometer part. And I've made a bit of a mess of that, but I don't think it's going to matter when it goes back together too much if these are a little bendy. Can always get some bigger pliers ready and just sit that on the edge of the vise and whack it with a hammer or something. So this has a spring. I mean, it's going to have to come out because if we undo this little spring here, it should just pull out. Ooh, we've got a little, oh, we've got a brass shaft going right up the inside of it. That probably wants a bit of re-lubrication, but that's definitely not our problem. And there we have it. A motor. Oh, no, she is stiff. It's the motor. It does move, but only just. So, I need a Phillips head. Well, let's hope this motor isn't completely cactus because it won't be easy to get a replacement. Again, because I think this is a fairly specialised, I guess I better mark because that's probably polarised. Mark it where it went sort of thing. Because even though I can work out where they line up. Ooh, that's tight. So do I need to pull it apart or can I just get some oil in there and... Oh, is it this front bearing? Well, at least this isn't a cassette player or anything, so a bit of oil in there isn't going to hurt anybody. Even if it comes out on this worm wheel again. Oh yeah, that's instantly, instantly freed up. Look at that, just like that. So it's just, yeah, I reckon it just hasn't been used. I mean, fancy having an amplifier that you can sit around for 20 years and not use it and it fails. <laughs> that's probably a first for that. You expect it with mechanical stuff. That's running like a beauty. Well, I think we can call that fixed. Get all the oil off me and the worst of it off there. It's probably just a bit of seized up grease. I mean, ideally, you'd pull the whole thing the bits, but I don't think there's any real point. I didn't want any markings off, did I? Uh, that went that way. So I guess in. Well, could I have got oil in there? Probably not really without pulling the whole thing to bits, but maybe you could get some in there. Maybe I overdid it in the disassembly a bit, but I really wanted to check that it was the motor that was even faulty. And I was almost expecting to have to dismantle it a bit. But I, you do not want to pull those motors apart if you can help it. Because once you pull this bottom end off, I'm not even sure how this one comes apart. 
trying to get the brushes back they're usually split either side of that shaft and I think they must have something in the factory to spread them apart from outside or something from these little holes or something there's probably a way of doing it but they don't just go back together normally probably should have left a bit of that oil on there but I might put a bit of grease on this thing I think certainly can't add to, oops, springs coming off it's got some horrible muck on there it's looking a bit blackened I think the grease is still pretty pretty good in this thing but I might have to remove some of that and I'll put a bit of that polyglide stuff on there Why did it go that way, I think? Just don't lose that spring. And I might even put that back in there, I think, before I put any more on. Yeah, let's throw that one in like that. And I think I actually pulled the brass bit out, didn't I? So let's put that black bit in there. I don't think it makes any real difference, actually. And yeah, shove that through until now. Got to work it out. This went because admittedly I didn't take an awful lot of notice. That spring did that come out the other side of there? God, it must have been bent a bit. All right, you can sort of shove it across there. It goes through that hole on the chassis, I think. I want to go through there though. Why aren't you going in there? Come on. There we go. Did I just get that in there? Not quite. It's on the edge of going through, but not there. Ah, you little. Are they both the same length? Or is that. That's. Oh no, that other one goes that side. Yeah, the other one's longer, I think. That's why I won't go through. So I need to get the other side in there. Ah. Now it's come off the shaft. Okay, so we're probably going to get this shaft a bit more organised when we go on. Yeah, down like that. It's always the little bits that are a pain. And then we're going to flick that out. Yeah, that goes through a lot easier. Oh, wait, that still isn't the right way around, is it? I thought when I spun it around this would... Oh, maybe it doesn't stick up on this side. Is that correct? That doesn't feel right. No, it's definitely not right. Oh, no, I don't think so. That's always the problem. It wouldn't go the... I thought I had it right the first time. Shouldn't that go? Yeah, that should. This should go through that side. Isn't that how I had it the first time? And it wouldn't work. Maybe I got it wrong. Yeah, that should pivot up. Yeah, no, I got it now. That's through there and should point upwards. And then this one should. You have to. Ow! Don't use your finger. Press it down to. Hang on. That's still not. Or is it right? I don't think it's sticking out that far. <laughs> well, the only other option is that I've got the spring on completely the wrong way around, but if that, yeah, I think I've got it right now, you've got to have the long side across with the pin up and the short side on the other side. Okay, of course the camera battery died, but I just had to tweak it a little bit sideways and get it through, get all those tabs bent again, so it's ready to go back in and see if it works. I guess we could hook the power up to it again and see if that at least, if it at least runs. Uh, 
Do I need to straighten those pins? I probably do. They did bend them over a bit. So I guess before I even bother to solder everything back together, might help if I get the soldering iron going too. Ah, it's actually bent back over. Oh, that's a, such a flimsy terminal. Really weird. They look solid, but they're as thin as alfoil, I think. I should really be using a bit of this thicker solder, I think. Makes quicker work of it. Okay. I can hear it. Hear it running. Feel it running. Yeah, we can see the pot pot turning in there. Oh, we should get the camera a bit closer, but the uh oh, we've stopped. Oh, what, what am I pressing? That's down. No. Oh, it went up, but it's not going back again. Oh dear, what is going on there? And yeah, you can't really manually turn these things because they do click and carry on a bit. So right, we go up. That works. Oh, down's working now. I wonder if you get to the end of jams or something. Oh, don't tell me that. It clicks. Works fine now. Oh, God. Why? So it must click on it. Well, that's weird. For a minute there, I couldn't get it to go back down. There are two down buttons, so it's not like it was a faulty button. Sometimes it clicks when it reaches the end. Oh, now we've got it stuck at the bottom end. This thing's still a bit jammy, I think. So if I give that a little Oop. click, yeah, and away it goes again. Uh, well, that ain't too promising. Certainly makes a lot of motor noise with the volume control out. Maybe it just needs loosening up a bit, but that sounds like more like an issue with the shaft part, you would think. Or maybe the way I put the gear back together. I really need to catch it in the act. When it clicks at the end, it seems to be all right, but when it doesn't click, so that's probably what that sprung, yeah, that's what that sprung bit's for, isn't it? That must be so that can click up and down. That's your slippage, yeah, that little... I might bring the camera down a bit. Turn that power off so I don't short anything out. It's not every day we get to see one of these things in operation, so... So that's the little um, worm wheel there. And it clicks up and down. When you get to the end, so it's got a sort of safety release thing, doesn't just jam everything up. And you can see the little elements going there in the in the pot there. Then we get to our clicky bit. Yeah, when that clicks, it seems to be all right, but sometimes it wasn't clicking, and then I couldn't get the thing going again. Hmm. And we've got a nice little bit of sound out of the audio to hear the digital electronics or something running there or is it just a motor noise maybe because this isn't earthed oh yeah if I the humming sounds varying whether I touch it or not well now it's quite reliable so I'm not sure why that did that Can't make it jam now, so I might have to leave this for a bit and I might just put it back together and see what happens. It's 
maybe that motor was still a bit sticky or something maybe it was something in the gears and it's meshed again i don't know that's really weird because i don't think there's anything you can really do with those gears is to stuff them up i did put a bit of grease on them too so maybe that has worked its way through there i might put a bit more on there because that could be what it is Because like I said, I only sort of spread the grease around over half of it, really, or parts of it. So maybe the dryness of the gears was... I won't put too much in there, but... I might have to get a bit in there. Because that'll spread itself out around the place a bit. I guess I'm going to have a look at the underside too while we're at it. Oh, we've done it again. Oh no, that's the wrong... I'm pressing the wrong button. That was the slow version. It doesn't help when you press the same side. I don't think I did that before because I tried the other side. You never know, I might have stuffed up and hit one of them because you'd almost expect the up and down buttons to do it, but they're going the same way. So unless I just press that, that low power one doesn't make it click by the look of it. Yeah, if you press that, that clicks it. Oh, maybe I was pressing the wrong thing. I don't think so, though. But that's the problem when you're not familiar with equipment. You can sometimes do silly stuff and convince yourself there's a problem when there isn't. But I did check and actually look at the front because I thought, am I pressing the right buttons? It was the first thing that came to my mind. Now, trying to get all these back in is going to be the fun part, I would think, since a lot of these pins are somewhat bent. Is that circuit board definitely facing that way? It certainly was by the look of the glue. That's only, only one or two ways it can go. I think I've got that on right. Despite all my marking of motors and stuff. Am I deluding myself about the way that glue went? I think I am. I guess the other question is, <laughs> if I did put it on the wrong way around, because it doesn't seem to fit in mechanically, Press, oh. Yeah, when I press up, it's going counterclockwise. When I press down, so I think I put, did put it in backwards. And yeah, all the glue on the motor looks like it lines up with the glue there. So I should have marked that as well, I guess. I guess the problem is because the battery died. I, it's been like two or three hours, I think, since I last looked at it. So I've completely forgotten which way the board was facing. That doesn't, does it? Oh, that does fit in. So maybe, oh yeah, okay. You know, it does match the other way around. No, the glue kind of lied to me. I misread it. It does look like it went the other way. And well, we've pretty much got proof because I'm pretty sure no one ever makes the pots go in the backwards direction, even when they're not accessible to the consumer. Like in this one, technically the pot could go either direction with the motor and it's not going to matter to anyone. Because there's no knob to see. But no, that was... That's what happens when you take a break. That's what normally you just finish what you're doing on the spot. But when there's a camera involved, it's a bit more difficult. So I think we now find that turns the opposite direction. Up is clockwise, down is counterclockwise. That's a good sign. And hopefully this board actually fits back in. Uh, 
Now the big fun part is trying to get, especially those front terminals of the pot, to line up with all the holes in the circuit board. Where are they? So the front row's going in, I think, is it? Yeah, the second row's gone in, I think. Yeah, there they go. <sighs> Thank God for that, because they were a bit bendy from the initial soldering. And of course it's trying to drop out. It's probably why a few of the pins are bent just in the factory to hold it in place for the wave soldering machine or whatever. Best thing is get one pin in, push it up hard, then we'll do one of these motor ones. Just the metal bracket, I think. Let that settle down. And just make sure everything's sitting hard against the board. Doesn't really matter because there's no mechanical use of this thing, so it doesn't really matter if it sits in on a funny angle or not. As long as it's electrically connected, nobody cares basically, but it's always nice to Put it back the way it should be. That's a ridiculous 16 or something connection, so I might use the big sword on the other one. So, oh yeah, I was going to have a look, see if I could find a manual for this thing, so oh, it had so many connections, what they all do. But that completely slipped my mind, but anyway. It's not that important, it's just interesting to know sometimes when you come across this weird stuff, just to learn what they did. Not that it's really worth worrying about too much these days, that chip there doesn't look the best soldering in history. That's that big Sanyo chip. I might as a bit of routine maintenance. Any sold of that. Ah, without bridging the pins preferably. Is that bridged? I don't think it is now. That's no, all good. But yeah, these are not very good looking. Ah, did it again. Not very good looking joints. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there, it's not real good. And even when you resolder them, they don't look like they're taken the best. If you've got a good tin circuit board, These solders should just flow in there beautiful and look make a nice shiny joint. This side seems a bit better. I didn't really need to solder that one because it's not connected to anything, but I tend to do them all anyway. Because otherwise, every time you look at the thing for dry joints, you see the ones you didn't do. And they catch your eye. This almost looks like someone has replaced the chips in this one. Don't know for sure, but given the flux on those, they've either been soldered in later or possibly because wave soldering machine, that chip probably would wobble around and stuff because it's quite big. That one, whether you could get it right for the heatsink or whatever, that looks like a dry joint right there. Whether it really was, but definitely on its way to being a dodgy joint. And yeah, the rest of that looks pretty good. We've got the power section. Most of that looks fine. Well, all of it looks fine, really, so... Otherwise, I'd be resoldering the ones that didn't. And then we've got the problem with this horrible yellowy front on this thing. I, like I 
so I don't know if that can be polished out or retro brought it out or what you do with clear perspex that's playing up. Make sure got nothing under there, including solder that can short anything out. And we've got the volume quite high now. Yeah, I can hear it even though we're not on that input. Nice down. I wonder if I did confuse myself by pressing the downside. I'm starting to think that's all it was. Let's go to the right input. Turn the tape. Well, that's even that's quite loud. Seems louder than it was. Yeah, that seems to work all right. I wonder how I get this remote thing to work. I say, is it do you just take a voltage that's going in there and reverse it or something like that? But then my three pins, not sure, but this all seems to work. Okay, so let's fire this up. See, so we've got two speaker. No, we don't because we haven't got no power. Two speaker lights. Input lights. Let's get rid of that sound and we've got our oh with these you've got to click, they don't continuously move. So you've got bass, mid and treble. A bit different. Volume still goes up and down whether you've got any volume there or not. Or full volume you can hear that other channel even though, or other input even though I've got the tape monitor on. Good old Darude. Whoever wants to hear that again. Been played to death a bit. So, the next thing I think is what are these little. It's got some of those little plastic clips there, is it? Make sure I get the grease off that screwdriver. Are they part of this? Or is that. Oh, that's another bit inside there. I think that might be part of the display or something. Got a few scratches on it, which is annoying. Bit of damage on the end there. You're not going to get a paint to match that colour in Ari, probably. But it's going again, and it's got a kind of cool, cool front panel on it with the LEDs and push buttons and stuff. So I guess they were trying to maybe get into that era a bit more of what would eventually become remote models. And I like that even the headphone sockets are different colours. So that's nice. Oh well, that just comes off easy as. And even that looks cooked, the edge of it's lighter than the... <laughs> but that's not the main problem, that's still rather yellowed. I wonder if that's just a piece of Perspex that can be replaced, that would be ideal, but I think it's a, you know, it's a special bit with chamfered edges and all the rest. So here's our little switches. Looks like the rubber's still good on those. Still can't see a lot of what's going on with these LEDs. They are some sort of bar. I don't think they're the standard LED bar graph type setups. These are made by the factory, I think. To their own design. They're not the sort of off-the-shelf ones. That bit might be a bunch of five LEDs, I think, moulded into one case, like you'd find in boom boxes and stuff quite commonly. How does this bit come out? Is it? Oh, that's what that top, top bit of stuff is for. They've got something written on. They do look like an actual part that someone's put in there, rather than just a one the factory invented for themselves. Hmm. Now I probably can't get this back together. Not easily because oh, the system LEDs are out. Speaker system ones. But that is definitely darker colour than it originally was, which probably makes this Perspex look worse than it is. Yeah, you can see a bit from that. But yeah, this is quite a thick bit of Perspex. It sticks out through the front, chamfered sort of edges, and it's got a thinner piece comes in the back here. What have we got on there? Someone been trying to clean it? That's on the inside, I think. Inside or outside? I can't tell. 
That's just a horrible piece of plastic, basically. You wouldn't want to be looking through that all day, would you? So the question is, can anything be done with it, or am I stuck with a pretty cool amp with a rubbish front on it? At least give it a quick clean and see if it makes any difference at all, which I doubt. I think those swirly patterns are on the inside. Is it coming loose? It is a little bit, I think. Oh, it's mainly stuck on my double-sided tape, I think, because I thought all this brown glue, but that's holding the plastic bits in. I'm going to see these goldy coloured strips around the edge are what holds the plastic in. But yeah, that's just misty and horrible. I guess the whole front panel can be cleaned off. At least see what it looks like. There's a bit less grot on it. That's got some weird yellow colour bit there too. Nothing's going to come up amazingly better because it's actually fairly clean this thing for a change. Other than the scratches and stuff. It's got some sort of yellowy coloured stuff on there. I don't know what that is. I wonder if I need to polish it off, and I might try a bit of polish on this Perspex. That's just horrible. I don't think they're meant to have anything that colour on them. I think that's definitely some sort of... I'll try this. Bunnings polish. And it may completely destroy the thing, but at this point I don't care that much. it's pretty worthless and it's got quite bad scratches on it anyway finer ones but a lot of them it looks to me like someone else had the same idea of trying to clean this discoloration off it can I take that little bit of Ooh, is it coming off or am I cutting through everything <laughs> I think it's taken a bit of it off Gotta be so careful, oh yeah, that's getting rid of that yellowy stain on the, on the front panel, so that's one good thing. That's gone. Oh, one little bit left, or oh, a couple of little bits left. Though, so that may be something to do with a lack of coating, so you gotta be a little careful what you take off of these things. This may have made this even milkier, and I suspect it might have actually done that. Seems to have scrape marks on the inside. I still think they're on the inside, but they're so hard to tell. But I'm half tempted to actually replace this with some clear perspex. Or maybe see if someone can at least cut the edges off a bit of perspex with the same angles. Even if I don't have this back bit, you could probably edge glue it or something. Anything's got to be better than what it is at the moment. That's made no difference at all, I think, and those, those marks, wherever they are, are still there. Are they on the outside? Someone's had something on this. Oh, it's just it's really weird. You can't tell if they're on the top or bottom, or maybe surely they're not internal to the plastic. They certainly don't seem to be on the surfaces. Are they on the upper surface? God. There's some really bad swirl marks or something on there. They must be on the upper surface, surely. But from the upper surface, they look a bit like they're on the lower surface. I think that's actually... I think that might be internal damage in the plastic or something. I could be wrong, but... It doesn't look like it's on either surface, which is really weird. So I guess if this plastic has started deteriorating, maybe it's... Yeah, they're still there, but look at it. 
Maybe it's an internal. Some sort of breakdown on the plastic or something. That is so weird. Usually it's pretty obvious where they are, what sort of depth in the plastic, but they're not. Yeah, it's just as horrible as before, I think. They might. Those sort of, I don't know if it'll come up on the camera, the weird sort of swirly marks in it. It's certainly weird, not really something the average human would create in a... It does look more like some sort of swirls that would be in there in the plastic, but... I don't know what that is. When you look at it side on, it's pretty bad. Yeah, from the inside it looks like it's on the outside, and from the outside... Yeah, it looks more like it's internal. It doesn't look like it's on the complete other side. So I'm going to take a risk and see if I can get this thing loose because it's starting to come loose. It's almost all loose down that down the top side. But I can see something. What is moving there? Weird, like a liquid under it, but I guess it's just... Oh, is that what? Well, probably is a liquid under there because I just sprayed it, so the liquid must have gone in. Uh, oh, that's exactly the noise I don't want to hear, but it didn't break anything, surprisingly. Uh, usually that'll be a little ooh, little thin bit of plastic breaking, and then it's got these little tiny tabs on the bottom side. I don't know if I can get it out here because it's got this other plastic thing in the way. Don't make me take the button assembly off. Oh, it's levering itself up anyway, I think. Oh, does this? Oh, no. Oh, yeah, it is. It's the... Ah, oh, no, it's the LEDs. And they've gone the same as well. It's the actual four LEDs. Ah, oh, that's a pain. But yeah, that plastic's yellow on the edge on even, so it's not like it's a surface thing. I think it'll probably look better just with that gone. I'll just check here, that's not gonna... I'll clean that knob. Clean everything I can get to while the cover's off. The volume... Oh, that's not volume, is it? What am I thinking? Oh, what is that? Balance. So the balance control is still a pot. All these buttons are pretty dirty. Ew, what the... It's smearing everywhere, whatever it is. Power button is terrible. That's going to need some polish on it, I think, because it's corroded. Oh, show. Sure. Nearly swore. Because I nearly broke that, I think. must have been loose because it just popped back in place. Good chance to clean all the holes. So, one thing to do when well, one side's all horrible looking, usually because of some environmental stuff falling on it, whoops, is not throw it on the floor, that doesn't work. But I think we can flip that upside down, that one. So, it's in no better condition, but nobody will know any better. Other than it looks better. Let's see if that pot knob can be... 
think that's actually removing it. Oh, that was just light damage there. That has actually got rid of the worst of that. And that may have a little bit too. Sometimes you just get lucky and it comes off. And these buttons are probably the same, could probably be flipped over if you needed to. Let's see if the front goes back on. better without the Perspex there at all I think. Still a bit, you can see the darker colour of that bit. Isn't that weird that it's actually, I wonder if something's coming out of the plastic or something. I mean if it's been in the sun, that was my initial thought, is wouldn't it cook the outer bit before it cooks the inner bit? It's almost like that Perspex colour change, but strangely the strip up here hasn't been affected, unless that's just completely different paint on there or something. That's quite weird when you think about it. You think that bit would have been protected, or is that the point? Oh, I know. That's the original colour. <laughs> That'd be what it is. Well, let's have a look. Oh yeah, we're a bit darker on the inside, aren't we? Are we? A bit? Yeah, I think that's just, I think it's faded over time. It's hard to tell, it's not that obvious. But let's compare that. Yeah, it's definitely darker than the, the upper part of that. But then why would the upper part be light? That still doesn't make any sense. That would have been even better shaded. I'm thinking, well, the Perspex probably protected this, but then why is it that light? And the bit that hasn't had any sunlight is light as well. Okay, now that's that theory blown out of the water. So it's definitely gone darker on that bit. I think the inside of this is maybe a still a little bit darker than the outside, but that doesn't make any sense. And in fact, what's this bottom bit look like? Yeah, now that's darker than the top bit, I think. Well, it's pretty rare that light makes things go darker, but it probably does happen occasionally. But why would the bit through the Perspex... What about this bit? This is darker where the slot is, so... I think that again proves that the sun has made it go darker. Maybe the Perspex amplified the effect. Or, like I say, maybe these bits of aluminium in here just have different paint on them. In some way because that bit and that bit have gone darker. Front panel hasn't. Yeah, it's kind of annoying not having the plastic in there, but it is so horrible. Ugh, yeah, no, it just looks terrible with that. Luckily this thing didn't cost an awful lot because it wasn't really worth it. There was a tuner with it as well, and I thought, nah, I'm not buying that because that had yellowy plastic as well. And what good is a tuner in the modern world in a way? I probably should have got the matching one, but in this condition, if it was a cool tuner, I would have added it to my tuner collection because it wasn't that expensive, but it wasn't. These are kind of not very nice little tuners, really, that go with these. Even these amps are not that impressive looking, but this one's certainly unique. But I think it's going to have to have a hole in the front for the time being. At least I've got the plastic out so I can see whether I can get anything done about it. Now why have I got a spare screw? Well there's one missing out of the bottom. I never took one out of the bottom, did I? That's rather weird. Oh, it looks like we're missing one, so maybe I found one underneath it. That's probably what it was. There probably was still one missing out of the bottom cover. But yeah, that's what it looks like. With no plastic in it. And a reminder, that's kind of what it looks like with the plastic in it. Yeah, I'm sorry, but no plastic is better. And I 
I guess this is, this is another sort of colour again, this colour, isn't it? Though, to be fair, that looks like it's rather dirty. But is it dirt or is it discoloration? I think some of that came off. Let's have a look at it. There's definitely dirt on it. Look at the back there. Oh, yeah, it's on the rag to prove it. But you never saw this part of it much normally, so I don't think they're too fussed what it looked like. But yeah, they're certainly unique, the Marantz, for having that sort of colour scheme. In a world of black and silver, make quite a nice change. And it was kind of a nice touch. Shame they didn't use, they used copper screws in some of their stuff, but, well, they weren't copper screws, copper coated screws, which kind of made them look cool. Looked a little bit more professional, but it was just, you know, more a, a shiny orange colored screw, really. Just normal steel screws, but I don't know, something about it looked kind of good. Even though it didn't do a single thing. This will be that one last quick test. Oh, yeah, the power button fitted, so I know that. So that is the crappy side down. Uh oh, did I unplug the power? Looks like I did, or it fell out. And uh, CD's finished. Both those bottom LEDs don't seem to work real well, so I wonder if there's some dirt or something in there, because that's what it kind of looks like, but like they've been blocked off. That one's yeah, a little there, well, not the greatest little lenses or whatever they have, but yeah, that's annoying. Oh, don't make me pull it to bits again. Yeah, that's a bit disappointing. The triple ones are fine. They're probably the best of all of them, actually. The others do tend to have one side of them on some are not as clear. Oh no. Oh, I really don't want to pull it apart, but I might have to just have a quick look. I do kind of want to have a look at those LED things, but maybe not. Maybe not look that closely. But I guess being a rather unique amp. And I do have to say those four LEDs in the front look pretty bad without the perspex. So what I could do is just cut this strip off, put those bits back in. It's almost tempting to do that now, so we've at least got the LEDs working. And then see if I can find another piece of perspex. I and mean, that probably is the thickness of a normal sheet of perspex, even if you can't get someone to route it out. So if you had a good routing machine, you could probably route that out down to that thickness and get the chamfered edge on it. No doubt that's how they made it in the first place. I mean, it could have been molded, I guess. Who knows? I don't know what they did in the factory. But it could be worth talking to a plastic fabrication place. And seeing what sort of price they could come up with some replacement or I could just do a dodgy job and Maybe you could sort of grind it off, sand it off, use something to cut a, a slanted edge on it, and then just polish it with some of that polish. Or maybe a more aggressive polish to start with, probably, or sandpaper. And come up with something similar yourself. Power's off. 
this should just yeah, lift as an outer bit and an inner bit. Sometimes the inner bit comes up, sometimes it doesn't. That's what the side cutters were invented for. But yeah, what an annoying little feature. I don't think it'll be faulty LEDs causing that. So that's what it looks like. It's got some little driver chips by the look of it. But I don't think we're going to get anywhere without taking the whole circuit board out, unfortunately. Which probably means unscrewing... Oh, so the switches are built in the same plastic housing by the look of it. Oh, that, that looks like a lot of work. I guess we're going to have to take these very carefully. Oh, take these knobs off, they come off there. Ooh. Yeah, that's getting it loose. Where we put those. Are they symmetrical? I don't think they are. Oh, probably not. They could actually do a little bit more of a clean, I think, but. And uh, I don't think it's soldered to the other board, or is that just oh, that's another connector? Whether we'll have much room to work. No, don't need to touch that, I don't think. It's only the six screws, I think. Come on. That one doesn't want to come loose. It's kind of loose, but it's not. Take the whole front off or something, you probably only has a circuit board right behind it, that'd be right. I knew they're gonna do something like that. I'm have to take some bottom cover screws off to get the free out the front. That might be enough lift up and stuff to drop them out. But every wire is holding it together enough that we can't get these switches free, can we? I've just, just been careful. Just got it free. And there's, of course, another wire going into what? Looks like that should unplug. But it's a solder connector that doesn't like to cooperate. Sort of connector you push in and don't get out again. Oh, come on, Link. There, must be, there is a key to doing these, I think, but so the yellow faces the front. No, oh, don't tell me they solder on. They sure do. Oh. Yeah, it's all these pins here. What an odd assembly. But it's not a big deal to get out, I guess. Oops, trying not to melt the wire. Carefully flick those up without destroying the circuit board, preferably. Mm, 
not a fan of people bending things over like that, but I guess I could say for the way of soldering or something, they've got to do it. Quite common in equipment. What on the earth? M100K ohms. Well, it's not a pot, is it? So they're just a button assembly. Who knows? That's got a couple of rivet things. Can we pop? I don't think these are meant to be dismantled somehow. Got little pin things there. Well, that's annoying. That is not much fun by the look of it. They've been melted, I reckon they've been... They don't look like the normal melty ones, they push them through and melt them. Something's holding them together. I don't think I'm going to have any luck with that, I think once these are... Gone, they're gone. Though it looks like you can lift this piece that would be the piece to remove, if anything, the side of the LEDs here. They're certainly pretty well sealed. I don't think anything can really, I guess something can get in up through the circuit board there. I thought maybe a bit of dust or something, but... God, I didn't really want to force that in like that, but it went anyway. Can I pop... Yeah, those pin bits are definitely holding it. And there's four of them, but... Are they sort of melted over or what? Or cut them off with a knife? Ooh! <laughs> well, I did something to it. I think they are melted over kind of things. I'm surprised it didn't snap off. That one did. I mean, either way, they're not really reusable. You either got to cut them off and they're not reusable. Ooh, that one shot back on. Sort of thing I should not be messing around with. But when else are you going to pull one of these to bits? Try cutting these other two off. That's a lot easier than breaking them off. Yeah, that's definitely got them free. I was hoping this piece would come loose, but I don't think it does because we've still got this other piece in the way. This is not really something you necessarily want to dis start disassembling on, I think. Well, that's starting to come. But these rivets are holding that bit on, I think, so that's going to hold that bit on. But can we free this whole other piece? Probably not. Ooh, something's happening. And that's also loose in theory, but not doing what I want. So I don't think this, this upper half is a separate bit, but it doesn't seem to want to come free. It's got some sort of greasy stuff all over this. What is that stuff? There was a little bit I noticed in the joints. I thought, oh, did I leave a bit of grease on my screwdriver or something, but... I think you may have to drill out. That is, is, oh my god, is that like what? Surely it's not a pot or something in there. I wonder if it is a mechanical. Yeah, each time. <laughs> ah, wonder, wow, is it just one light then in there? Each time you press these things, I can see something sliding up and down. Oh, of course, well this is a, oh my god, so this is actually quite an interesting, so of course it is a potentiometer because it does the tone control or whatever. So that slots, but I reckon the LED too is just one light possibly. It's actually a mechanical, like a stepped pot. This is actually a fascinating little piece of kit. I'm going to have to drill those little rivets, or can I cut them off? Squeeze them in or something. I don't fancy drilling it and putting bits of brass shavings everywhere, but I might have to try. Well, it's not very often you get to pull something like this apart, so that's when you've got to learn. But yeah, this is a quite an interesting little gadget they've got here by the look of it. 
the crazy things these people came up with. Oh, it's starting to go, but it's spinning at the same time, of course. As they often do, probably because it's melting a bit. Right, when you nearly get through it, they always spin, but that might be thin enough that I can crunch it with a side cutter easily. I think that one might be spinning too, is it? Got to be super careful because if you suddenly drill through it, you may well keep going right through plastic and stuff. Oh yeah, it's pretty thin now, I think, isn't it? Mm, it's pretty hard actually, yeah, that's flicked over a bit. I guess the other thing is, could we hold it with the side cutters while we drill it? second. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't fit. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that's broken the worst of it off. I don't know about all of it, but a fair bit of it. And of course you risk actually damaging the thing and you'll never get one of these parts again. But yeah, it's just so annoying when you get the amp back together and then realize some of the lights don't actually work. I mean, no one's probably gonna set everything to minimum anyway, but still no fun having bits that don't work. Got all those cool LEDs and they're not doing their job properly, so that's a bit of a rip off. Again, I shouldn't really be using my circuit board side cutters for this but I think I might have got that. Let's see if it actually does any difference, make any difference and yeah that's coming. So I guess if you ever had to clean one of these you'd probably almost have to do this to clean the pots. Thankfully they weren't noisy but given how they kept out of the dirt and stuff so there it is, there's your potentiometer part. There's one of your clicky switches here yeah, look at this. <laughs> what an amazing contraption. Can I press this without destroying it? Yeah, it, just, it literally latches down or up. How do I get it to latch up? But it is just one light by looking at So why is the light failing to work properly sometimes? In some positions. So it's a little thing in a little slit there. Is there some sort of filth in there? Very hard to tell. Admittedly, it doesn't seem to come through as well. These have actually got some sort of weird defects in the plastic on the edge or something, rough patches. What am I seeing there? Was it cracked? Shouldn't stop it. Ah, might help if I put it to the light, not to the camera. I wonder if they were made that bad to start with, I don't know, or do they not sit quite right? Can that just slide out? It can. Well, it's starting to move. Oh, there we go. There's your little plastic light guide. And there's nothing wrong with it. I thought maybe there'd be a bit of dirt on the end or something, but... Since being the bottom ones, you would assume that, that something could get in here and fall down. So hang on, is it going back in? There we go. <clears throat> so yeah, it must be two contacts here, go to that little LED in there. Is that where it is? Oh, up this end, get it right. I mean, if it works on some of them, though admittedly this one was kind of half looked a bit like it was off centre or a bit dirty or something, but and the other option is something's worn mechanically. The 
doesn't look like it. Ooh, there's a ball bearing in there. I better be careful of that. That must hold each, in each position at the back. That's what this little brass, not brass, copper bit on the back is for. That's to hold the tension on a ball bearing. Now, probably do I have to move the little lever on this to get it to slot, drop back in. Uh, what is going on here? The LED's catching on something. Here we go. I almost need to light it up. I can't light it up because the slide plate's missing which gives voltage to it. <laughs> That'd be right. Oh yeah, so that walks it down. What a clever little design. Yeah, it's got a little bendy bit that sort of walks it. And then latches. That is such a clever little, like a little staircase of little ramped off bits there that then, <laughs> very clever little design. I probably should give that a clean while I'm in here, but Absolutely beautiful quality contacts, massive fingers on it, so I think they've designed it so it doesn't play up easily. But I'm none the wiser as to why it was faulty. For all that work. But you can pull them apart and fix them if you had to. Yeah, that hits an end, so they automatically stop. No, oh, I should have made a note of which pins are the LED, shouldn't I? Ah, oh, dearie me, that would have been the smart thing to do. It assumed to be some of those at one end. At least it holds itself back together pretty well good enough that you wouldn't even necessarily need to glue this or anything, but admittedly there's not much holds it to the circuit board except that one side, so it probably needs something. So that's the LED. So one of them goes to that end. So that's the end ones. Hmm, brilliant. So if we just solder a 9 volt battery snap or something with a 390 ohm resistor on it, that should be enough to... Yeah, that, that holds together pretty well. I don't think that's going anywhere unless you force it apart. And I don't know what the polarity is, but let's see if this will work. I guess I'll probably measure it with a multimeter to see which way the diode seems to go. But I've got a 50% chance of getting it right, which means probably 100% chance of getting it wrong. With Murphy's Law. Oh, it's lit. It's not looking too bad on that bottom one. Very weird. It does still have a bit missing. But then the other ones have a bit to one side missing, it seems. So what on earth did I do to it? At least it's better. Top one doesn't look perfect either. Sometimes there's something out with the plastic. But there you have it. So the top one is the anode. That probably is why it has a bit of gooey stuff on it. It probably does have a bit of lubricant in there. Hmm. Well, I'll be darned. Is it gooey stuff on the board? No, that's just flux. Uh, which way did it go? It must have gone that way, I guess, because... Yeah, the other ones are that way. They've drilled five holes on both spots for the connectors, though, even though there aren't five pins on both of them. Why won't you come through? The other thing I was going to check is, do I melt a couple of these little bits Probably should, I guess. That may 
maybe enough to hold it together. Now I know what's going on, I think that's bent a bit still, that was the bendy pin and it's probably my solder blob from putting that thing on there is holding it out a bit. Yeah that's it. Okay I did find a service manual for this amp. Turns out it was, um, looks like it was made between 82 and 84 or sold between then. But what I did find out too, I looked at the circuit in this thing, and yeah, it's a bit of a weird setup, but that um, Sanyo chip there, the 781 LC7815, that basically controls all this input selection stuff, and the 4066 IC does the tape monitor, that little CMOS chip there. But they have nothing to do with these, the other bar graph thing here on the volume control, and that's what turns out that from the look of the manual it doesn't actually show what's inside there but that's those 16 connections to the volume control does that by the look of it so somehow i think there's plus or minus 16 volts or something coming into these things and then somehow the outputs feed each one of these leds individually but they're also all in series so it comes in hooks to each led so i assume it must be some sort of rising voltage or something that goes in there. I just had a quick check with the multimeter on those pins in that whatever it is and there's not much to read there was some pins joined I think others are like 10k ohm or something so that's probably some external resistance I'm not sure if they're some sort of encoder switches or what they are but this is a very weird design so it's basically looks like it's got a fair bit of digital circuitry in it but it's all basically fake in this thing so they're the little stepper switch stepper mechanical steppers and even this thing here doesn't even come out of that chip it's basically the volume control controls it through switches or something so they're obviously trying to look a lot more digital than they actually are I mean it's pretty early technology and like I say the chips were expensive then but um, it's all really just analog displays fed via switches and stuff so I'll be interested to see if I can actually get some sort of measurement on this thing without pulling it all to bits again. There must be a voltage feeding into that row of LEDs. So I got the first one on, maybe we should put a couple on. No, that's audio. Oh, audio muting. That was another thing I noticed was in there. So it actually dims the LED by the look of it. Let's... Oh yeah, it doesn't actually... <laughs> doesn't turn them off or change them, it just dims them. Because I noticed it switched a resistor in line there somewhere, so oh well there you go. Very dodgy design really. So it's something to do with those switches, obviously switch in line more LEDs. you think they'd just switch them on one at a time or whatever, but they actually are all in a series chain. So we've got three of them on. Have to find, oh, this ground is probably the chassis here. So look at that, I would assume the voltage goes up, but maybe I'm wrong about that. So that's the bottom three LEDs. I think one of them goes to minus 16 volts, which it doesn't seem to. Oh, I've got six volts, eight volts, because I should have about two volts across them. 8 volts which is joined to that one then it should go up 2 volts 10 volts roughly 12 volts and then I'll have 12 volts on one side and nothing on the other very weird so it's actually 6 volts on the bottom of it probably because there's a resistor there But it doesn't show, in the circuit it just shows eight pins just randomly connected to those LEDs and nothing else doesn't show what's inside the actual switches. Like you think a circuit diagram should tell you, show you the internals so they don't even bother showing that which is weird. 
okay let's have a look and see I don't know, a few things here could be the rails coming in we've got minus 11 zero and 11 well, they said about 16 volts in the manual but it looks like it's more like plus or minus 12 volts so they come in here got 12 volts there by the look of it 12 volts there hang on what's going on then minus 12 8 9 12 yes yeah, so that's the the three LEDs and that must be the so it's actually minus 12 I think there's a resistor somewhere so that's where does that go to a wire or something so we know these ones are powered up 7.9 9.8 and that's probably showing 12 so those three so that's coming out of there now the question is are they just shorted to something uh, which I forgot which one I said it was which was 12 and which was negative 12 no obvious connection not even that now it's the bottom one here it also goes to that one so that's going to be connected to something right There, 1.7. Don't tell me it's a resistance. Well, whatever I measured before seems to have gone. So that's the one that's connected to. to do anything at least on this side it does go to the other switch as well Ooh, what have we got that's what it's connected to so there's not even any connection here what the how's that humanly possible unless you got to measure the other it wouldn't be some sort of diode which one was the 12 volts in Although if we get to 12 volts, then we're going to have to go more than 12 volts. Oh, but maybe that's being pulled down by this. 12 volts has probably been pulled down to 12 volts. The minus, that goes into the switch. The positive goes into the switch on that third one. That's got to be a connection, you would think, between the positive and what was it, the third one of these. 10k no connection to that mega ohms to that what the oh, unless if they put a voltage we'd have to get an incrementally higher voltage each time to run more LEDs if they're in series it doesn't mean it could mean those two are not even connected that's just the they're just connected via the LEDs which we should be able to measure somehow on diode would help can we measure it? 1.7 that's probably your forward voltage drop and that is connected to what? by 10k to that k to that one so if we've got a 10k resistor through and then the three leds are in there's only three two four six volts but then that is a sitting up more like six volts itself the bottom line or if that's even the one the other side of their leds very strange let's um go down one led 
not too lit. So we should have a lower voltage because there's only two LEDs in series. We should have no voltage on that one now. Oh, I'm on bloody ohms. Dude, what? 12 volts? Oh, 12. Ah, oh, is it shorting them out? Ugh, what the? But those ones weren't shorted 12 volts. So they're both now 12 volt. So that LED, if it's shorted out, of course it won't light. <laughs> well, that's weird. And if we go ohms from that 12 volt line to there, I'd assume, yeah, we're back to 10k. And that's 10k, so they're both shorted to it in a way. So maybe it is just some sort of switch encoder. I don't know where the 10k ohms is coming from, or is, is well, there's no resistor as such. So maybe it shorts out the LEDs. But I haven't seen how it gets the higher ones running either, so. Let's turn them all on, full volume. Twelve volt, nine point eight. So the voltage is going up. It changes on each one of them. Now we're down to four volts on the bottom LED. Hmm. Okay. Oh, well, from there to there, it's probably ten k. Yep. And yeah, no connection to any, so it's running the whole chain of LEDs by the look of it. And then it just, what, shorts out. How do they do it without changing the brightness, I wonder? Well, because the volt, oh, look, I'm not even gonna, <laughs> not even gonna go there, I don't think. And why do they need two banks of them? Maybe one to start shorting out the others. I mean, that's a lot of 16 connections. And like I say, unfortunately, the circuit doesn't show anything inside that. I mean, I could look up the part number for the volume control or parts list and see if it says anything about it, but I don't think it will. Other than just to say it's a so many K pot probably, and that's it. You've got no idea what is inside that, but I can see the contacts that move around in there. They look pretty much the same as the ones in the potentiometer. There's 10k across this thing. There's nothing written on it by the look of it as to what it is. It's just 100k times 2 for the volume. No stamping on the other bit. So yeah, it's whether it's worth actually trying to find out what's in there, you may even have to pull the encoder part or whatever it is, two bits. But it just shows that not a single thing on this is controlled by a digital chip. The only CMOS chip in there is just a bilateral, quad bilateral switch, which is really just made for switching analog signals through. And I'm not sure how even digital that. Um, Sanyo chip is, but I think they did show the internals of it. It might have had some flip flops or something in there. Just to do the input selection. So that's about the only true part of this thing that is actual push button. I mean, the, the push buttons for the volume control just make a motor turn. These actually mechanically click potentiometers up and down and move an LED physically <laughs> to each little light thing and then we've just got loudness and muting which is the normal analog sort of thing so this tape monitor and the other three actually go into a chip and switch and are actually soft touch controls as such and that's it this thing is appearing to be very digital looking in the early 80s but it's all fake basically 
it's all actually either mechanical switches or a motorized volume pot or some sort of switches slash potentiometer things that that feed a five LED bar there. So yeah, very interesting. It's quite an interesting amp, much more interesting than I thought it was gonna be. I thought it was just gonna be another boring amp. I did like the look of it though, because it was a bit different with these, what I assumed were LEDs, of course I didn't see it plugged in or anything. But it turns out it's quite different to what was expected and quite a bit of innovation used in it to avoid having to use digital chips and stuff and actual proper soft touch controls. So the later ones, of course, when you press these up down buttons, they actually stepped it up in segments, digitally lifted the volume up a bit at a time. I mean, you can usually hear them when you press on them, there's a little mute sound or whatever kicks in and they're not a pure analog thing, I don't think. So at least it's kept, you know, a genuine analog volume control. And genuine analog, although these obviously step up in little mechanical segments, so they're not fully analog, as in fully variable, I guess. They, they're variable in small steps. So they've kept all that old school while pretending it's kind of digital. And I guess, like I say, just to get the aesthetics a particular way for this amp, I'll have to have a look, but I'd, I'd never seen one of these before, I don't think. And whether they were just this era 92 to 94 and that was it, this one and its bigger brother higher powered version, which I don't know that it's got as many LEDs on the front. I get a feeling it didn't have as much. And then they dropped all that just to go back to normal stuff. But yeah, it's a nice, nice little piece of the 80s history. Kind of a cool little unit if I can get some clear perspex for it. It'll look even better. And yeah, quite an innovative, weird system to to make it appear push button controls when really they're all all of those all the tone controls and the volume control are still just potentiometers and there's not even any digital control of them so quite a fascinating unit and the one thing i thought i, th I thought that volume indicator would come off the the chip there but i guess once it's a motorized volume control that's completely isolated from the chip that was just my initial thoughts early on before I sort of realised how this thing was put together. So they've had to come up with an analogue sort of way to make the volume bar go up and down. So yeah, rather interesting one that one, but it all seems to be working at least. So I'll give that one a bit of a test run and decide what to do with it, but I think I might keep that one. It's just quite a fascinating little amp. But anyway, thanks for watching.